Welcome to the museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Online Series. My name is Tania Melendez Escalante, and I am Senior Curator of Education and Public Programs. I am delighted to introduce Jazz and Twenties Black Glamour, moderated by MFIT Assistant Curator Elizabeth Way. It is a presentation by historian Alfonso McClendon and vintage performer Dandy Wellington, who will discuss the influence of jazz on 1920s menswear. Jazz and Twenties Black Glamour is being held in connection with the upcoming FIT graduate students exhibition, The Roaring Twenties and the Swinging Sixties, created in collaboration with the museum at FIT. We are grateful for their collaboration in this exhibition and in this public program. We hope you enjoy the show. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I wanna thank you both for joining us here at MFIT and also thank the graduate students um, who organized this exhibition and this panel on jazz and black glamour. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So we're gonna jump right into um, our discussion here. And I wanna ask, the first thing I wanna ask is, who are some of the famous figures that we should be thinking of and imagining as we listen to this talk? Um, and who are some of the less famous figures? So basically kind of who are your favorite finger figures in jazz um, from the 20s or maybe even later? Yeah, I would say um, starting in the 1920s, definitely I would say Bessie Smith. Um, that was her key recording period, um, as well as Louis Armstrong. He had, um, left New Orleans and he was in Chicago. And so he's really um, becoming well known. Um, people were going to the clubs to see him. He wasn't at the height of his fame, um, but he was definitely um, be coming onto the scene and making a name for himself. Um, Fletcher Henderson is also another one. He was in New York City. So he's part of the New Orleans, um, New York City jazz scene. Um, other women, Ethel Waters, um, there's Mammy Smith as well. Some of the less lesser known people might have been, um, I would say like Nina Mae McKinney. She was an actress. Um, mm -hmm. She starred in Hallelujah. So it had some, it had jazz music in there. Also, yeah. I would think about Ada Bricktop Smith. Um, she was a, um, she was in vaudeville as well as um, doing theater in New York City. And then she left for Paris. So that's why a lot of people are not as familiar with her. Also Alberta Hunter was a blues singer. She also went to Europe. Um, so those were some of the um, key people in the 1920s I can think about. Great, Dandy, how about you? Yeah, I mean, Alfonso, I mean, that's the list, right? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of great names on there, a lot of, lot of wonderful lineage. I would also, um, I would also, of course, add Jelly Roll Morton, uh, who, you know, Claim that he invented jazz all on his own, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, he was a he was a powerful figure and and continued to 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 innovate and 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 sort of dabble in all different versions of of show business and the origins of jazz and sort of influencing that. Um, but you know, when I when I, I I think about the 1920s, sometimes I like to to see the lineage. So when I when I when I think about who had been influenced, of course, we got James P. Johnson in that same realm when it comes to piano, and then moving on to, of course, Earl Father Hines, uh, who was such an influential piano player, played with Louis Armstrong. Um, and then, you know, sometimes I just got to drop Fats Waller's name just because it's Fats Waller, but he's not in the 1920s. Although, actually, no, it's true. He started in 1927, his recording career, if I remember correctly. Um, might be a little bit earlier, 1922. But yeah, and a I, lot of great names. Yeah, and I have to say, I'll be in trouble if I don't mention Duke, I forgot about Duke Ellington. Oh, yeah, yes, oh, dude, it was on my <laughs> list. It was on my list. And Sidney Bechet. Yes, Sidney Bechet. Yeah. What a sound. Yeah. What a sound, ugh. Okay. <laughs> so there were so many amazing figures who not only were, you know, contributing this amazing sound to America, but also had this really amazing look. And, you know, this exhibition is uh, focused on fashion in the 20s and also the 60s. But I want to ask you guys about who are the tailors and couturiers designing clothing for these jazz artists? And how are their fashions perhaps distinguished from mainstream fashion at this time? I would say that for the men, um, in the 1920s, um, 
we're coming off of the kind of the Victorian period, uh, more conservative. So for the men, um, a lot of them were leaving New Orleans where they played in um, Dixieland bands. Mm -hmm. um, and they had strict protocol on how they could dress. So they were in orchestras or bands. And so oftentimes they had to sign contracts. The contracts would say that you have, must wear a dark suit, can either be blue or black. You must wear a black tie, you must wear a white shirt. It also um, had protocol for behavior, whether you could smoke or not. Could you socialize on the stage? Did you have to be at rehearsal? So when we look in the 1920s and look at the fabulous images of the bands and orchestras, we'll see that they're all polished and sharp. They had to conform. They had to um, have a professional look. Count Basie said that's the first thing a musician had to get is either a suit or a tuxedo. And actually when um, Louis Armstrong went to Chicago, um, he didn't have the money that he would have later years. So he had a old tuxedo that he kind of patched up and he called it his old roast beef. Um, so yeah, so the men, you know, they wore, as you can see in this picture, like in Paul Banks Orchestra at Duke Ellington, they were very sharp. And it's because it was the uniformity of the band. You were not allowed to stand out. Celebrity and that kind of showmanship of one person didn't come to a little bit later. Um, but it was about the uniformity of the group. And for the women, I would say Bessie Smith is a great example of um, you know, high, what I would call um, exaggerating the look of the day. So in the early 20s, um, women were wearing a lot of um, shawls, beads, um, almost an Eastern, Middle Eastern kind of Orientalism type of look. It's hard to find out where these dresses were purchased in the 1920s. In biographies of Bessie Smith, there are, her, there are stories of Bessie, like when she was in Atlanta, they would walk out into the street once they arrived in town and they would sh you know, walk down downtown Atlanta and they would go buy, you know, if they saw a sh dress or shoes, they would go into a store and buy it. Um, there are a lot of, the men obviously use tailors most of the time in the black community. So they, they actually had no option sometimes. They couldn't, maybe not, may not be able to go to a white store or a department store. Um, so in the early days, I can talk a little bit later about some known designers who designed for um, some jazz performers in the maybe 30s, 40s, 50s. But in the 20s, it's difficult to kind of know who they purchased from because oftentimes they didn't keep these records. And Dandy, I know you um, were, uh, you know, a little, little bit of Black Tailors in Chicago. Could you talk about that? And also um, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, it was interesting. Um, you know, when I was even just processing this question, it's almost as if I'd never asked it of myself. I, you know, I was always so enamored by, um, you know, the way some of my heroes dressed, not to mention the, the actual music. Um, but then of course, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of what, you know, when you, when you start looking at history and really start to Im immerse yourself in these periods, um, so much of what happens outside of the music starts to relate and you, you start to think about black people moving through these spaces and, and places like Tulsa and that, you know, that community. And there's a lot of information there. And so it was, it was so obvious to me that there, there had to have been some sort of guide for um, musicians or, or, or black people as they traveled and migrated uh, to the North. And so I, I was looking in the Chicago Defender and I found um, Black's Blue Book, which, um, which happened to be a guide of, uh, of, of different businesses uh, that were black owned that people could frequent when they, when they visited Chicago. And I imagine there were other similar guides um, in black owned newspapers um, and, uh, and various, uh, various sheets throughout, throughout the, the country. So, um, you know, that's, that's absolutely uh, a, a resource, a possible resource. And, and even thinking about, thinking about like, the Negro Leagues, right? As they're traveling from town to town, they can't stay in the hotels, you know? They have to find places in the black community to stay. And you see that a lot with, um, with lots of other uh, jazz bands having to do the same thing, not being able to stay in the hotel necessarily. So you've got to find a place in the black community. And so there's always that connection. But, you know, speaking about what Alfonso was saying about, um, 
about the tuxedos and the uniforms. I really, really enjoy seeing the different specifics of these tuxedos because for instance, there's a photo that I that I threw up there um, of the King Oliver, King Oliver's Creole jazz band. They were getting ready to go out on tour. And so they had expanded the band um, in 1924. And so what you'll see is that everybody's tuxedos are a little bit different. You know, you've got this, you, you've got two guys wearing shawl collar tuxedos. And this one is a pretty, pretty long shawl collar. It's almost, it's below his navel. I mean, it has to be, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how tall he is, but it has to be. And, and some people are wearing peak lapels. Some people are wearing uh, notch lapel tuxedos. And so it's just interesting to see that, you know, it, it, yeah, it was in the rule book. You have to go out and get a tuxedo. You have to look a certain way, but it didn't necessarily specify, you know, peak lapel because it was just about the look. And so there's diversity in that uniformity. People people making making a way based on what they can afford, but also maybe based on their personality. I love that because I think so often we think about menswear, especially from this period and before as so uniform, but there are lots of little differences and people like you guys who know menswear well, know that there are a million little details that you can talk about for hours. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of details and then especially seeing people in, in the bands who maybe it was more of a pickup band, something that was just sort of happening, a, a, a sort of a weekly gig that maybe wasn't in, a, in, a, in, a, in an establishment that was really, you know what I mean? It was just sort of a pickup band. You see them wearing their street clothes and you start to get a sense of how people actually, not, not just how they dressed in, in a sort of glamorized version of it that we tend to see, but you know, real photos of how people showed up to a gig, you know, to, uh, to express themselves through music, to, you know, dig into this new art form called jazz. I love those photos because, you know, performance photos are not always the same as street fashion. In fact, sometimes they're very different, but with those photos, you start to see it kind of bleed together. Oh yeah, yeah, it's fun. It's actually fun to really dig into that specifically and, and look at, you know, what specifically is, a more of a candid photo somebody showed up with this with a camera you know maybe they that was that was their passion or they just had the money to buy this camera and so they show up to a gig and they decide to snap a photo of everybody as opposed to a promotional photo that maybe they did for victor or for swan records you know something like that and Liz, that would be interesting. the other thing i wanted to mention about um, some of these images that we're seeing is that along with their dress, it indicated how much money they were making. Talk about so it, please. Oftentimes, um, bands that wore tuxedos or really polished suits would have the better performances. So they would maybe be playing country clubs or whatever. So it really determined you could get higher wages. So oftentimes, if they're more casual in the pictures, they're probably not doing those top gigs. Um, at the time, in the I say the 1920s, um, late 20s, I think, $35 a week um, was the pay if you had an engagement that was running for a couple of weeks. So you could be in a $35 is a good, good pay. So you might get 15, 20. And again, it depends on um, who you're, um, who's booking you. The other thing I wanted to mention is that you can see in a lot of these band names, which I think is interesting for the um, 20s, and Dandy will probably be able to talk a little bit more about this, is that they were in, they were, the, the black community was somewhat, especially the jazz community was inspired by royalty. Um, so oftentimes they took their, they tried to outplay one another by having the best name. So they always use, they use names like All-Star, the original Creole, the, yeah. hot, um, the hot five, the uh, seven chocolate um, dandies, um, Bo Brummel. Um, so they use these things that are attached to the 1800s and the romantic period. So I, I find that fascinating that you'll see King, Queen, we know Duke Ellington, Count Basie. Count Basie even talked about that he came up with Count because he was inspired by Duke and King Oliver, so. Right, yeah, and it's so important to, to think about, you know, where where these per people were in relation to slavery, right? and 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 what it was to, in some of the, these first moments, you know, 
really take command of your own future and what how do you how do you do that not just with your chosen profession not just with maybe the way you dress but what you call yourself you know and 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 a thing like a name you know a thing like a name has a lot of weight in this time there's no social media there's no looking at somebody's feed and getting a sense of who they are or looking at their past work it's the name what does the name say to you you know and and a lot of these bands hadn't been recorded yet you know depending on when we're talking about uh cuz what was it ODJB recorded in 1917 so so it's like okay what about that name what does it say what who, who duke ellington the first time i heard the name duke ellington i was like okay <laughs> all right i need to listen to this you know i mean this was a period when like the entire black american community across the country was recreating itself creating mm -hmm. its own community and jazz was such an amazing way for people to do that through their names, through their clothes, through the music. Yeah. So jazz was a deeply embedded, was deeply embedded in parts of the African-American experience. So I wanna ask you, in what ways do you see the twenties and later jazz artists creating a dialogue between their fashion and style and the larger black community? And I'll also tack on, what about a dialogue between mainstream society? Well, I think for the, um as Dandy kind of mentioned, um, coming off the teens, um, the African-American experience was not great. And um, although these jazz artists were able to move out of maybe this parts of the South and go into New York and Chicago, it was still a pretty hard existence, um, sometimes walking through the back door of establishments to perform. Um, so I think the dialogue that started in the 1920s was that Jazz, play, jazz musicians, as well as the blues singers, were really um, representing Black America. So they were putting their best foot forward. And that meant um, the finest of dress, um, the classiest of behavior. Um, and they would, per, like Bessie Smith, they would go into, um, she was from the South, but um, from Tennessee, and she would go into Atlanta, Mississippi, other places. and. Um, inspire and kind of elevate those communities. Um, they probably saw, you know, they weren't used to seeing some of this, um, some of this performance, especially when she moved to Philadelphia and would still come back into the South. So I think they were the representation of our community. Um, we see also in the 1920s, the Harlem Renaissance happened. So Langston Hughes, it kind of was, we saw that the, the um, Black professionals or artists started to attack let me say attack, but they started to present themselves in through literature, art, and music, and theater. Um, so we think of theater, Rose McClendon. If we think of literature, Langston Hughes. We think of also as film, we have Oscar Michaud, who is a um, Black director who created most of the, um, all Black um, productions that were in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, so I think they, they were um, a representation and they helped elevate. And I always use the term that I think the um, jazz artists of the 20s were the unsung heroes of the civil rights movement. And a lot of people don't mention them as much. Maybe in the um, jazz artist of the um, 60s, 50s, modern period. But I think um, Bessie, Alberta Hunter, Ethel Waters, they were really the unsung heroes. They did a lot of work. They opened the doors for the advancements that happened in the 60s with the civil rights movement. Oh, that's so true because, I mean, it, you, you almost need to normalize these things. The, that's a big portion of it is, is pe people normalizing Black expression, normalizing Black people, um, bringing light and positivity into the world, but also striving for the betterment of their race and the betterment of themselves. These, these things are important and and, and of course, they, they sit in really difficult places because there's a lot of, you know, conventional, uh, very much normalized bigotry in society at this point, you know. Uh, there's, an, there's a reason why the, the Klan had a resurgence in the 1920s, 
you know, part of it was part of that, uh, you know, the nationalism after World War I, but a part of it is also looking at this rising music and, you know, this sort of the new Negro mm -hmm. as, as, an, as an affront to the, the Southern sensibility, the conventional Southern sensibilities. Um, and so, you know, you have this, this sort of fight between what has been a very much a, a cemented idea of what blackness is, you know, minstrelsy and all these racialized images, so many, so many of them that appear on sheet music. Um, and I mean, you can find them in thrift stores today. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, and Jemima and Quaker Oats that came out of all of that. It's, 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 it's there. It, it has always been there in advertising. And so jazz is an opportunity for African-Americans to challenge all of those conventional ideas. And they do that through clothing. They do that through polish. They do that through, um, you know, their brilliance on their instrument, their in instruments, their presentation. Uh, it's such an important moment. And, and exactly as you say, Alfonso, they really are the unsung heroes of the civil rights, uh, of the civil rights movement. I, I, when I think about sort of the racism that e we deal with today, um, it almost seems, I mean, it very much seems unintelligible. And, and, and also, it, it really is not to quote a, 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 a famous aspect of the, of the Civil War and Reconstruction, but a lost cause because Black people have been such a part of the, the, 21st, the 21st century, right? It's been so much a part of, of entertainment and, um, and, and culture, right? Just more, more than entertainment, just American culture that it normalizes every every time every time a, a, a person picked up a jazz record a musician picked up a jazz record and listened to Louis Armstrong play they just saw the name Louis Armstrong they listened to him play and they got excited they were like oh my god who is this how is he doing this I have to be like him and you look at you know you find out that he's black after you went through that emotion, how can you hate him? Mm -hmm. How can you how can you sit with that? You know, and on and on and on. You know, you can go. You can even if you want to just take the music lineage, and you want to go all the way through to now. How can you hate these people when they inspire you so much? When they when they they beg you to feel to love, you know. So they are absolutely the unsung heroes of the civil rights movement because they planted the seed. They got into people's hearts, into their feet, into their souls. And it really was so amazing that they're producing this, this original American art form. You know, it's been said so many times against a background of very harsh realities. We think about the twenties as, you know, um, the roaring twenties, it seemed fun and over the top in the Harlem Renaissance, but this was a very hard time, not only for black people in the South, but also in cities in the North. The rents were higher, the incidence of death and disease were higher in black neighborhoods. People were creating something incredibly original and new, as well as their style, um, as well as their, you know, their representation to the wider community. It really is an astounding achievement. Mm. And one of the things that I find so interesting about what both of you have been saying so far is um, kind of these regional differences, right? We're talking about these different cities. And of course, jazz was so regional, um, so different in different places. And it really just brings home this idea that um, even within the jazz community in America, there's no monoliths. There's so many differences um, everywhere and so much individuality. So I wanna ask a little bit about rebellion in jazz dress, rebellion against the mainstream society, rebellion against maybe more um, conservative aspects of black communities. Um, how were these uh, artists using fashion and their music to rebel? Well, I think um, I'll start out with like what Count Basie talked about when he was young. Um, he talked about that men, boys pretty much wore um, shorts or um, what we call breeches, somewhat um, knickers. And 
that you couldn't wear long pants until you're probably about 16, 17. He said that um, if your parents, you know, if they saw you wearing pants, long pants before your time, they thought you were trying to be too mannish, is what he would say. Um, he also talked about, which I think is interesting, is this kind of rebellion. He talked about um, it was trendy for certain um, guys to have one leg down and the other leg up. And that meant you had a little bit edge to you. Also, they would cock their hat to the side, almost like a newsboy hat. Um, they cock it to the side. Um, sometimes they flip it up. And what do we know that as now is kind of what the hip hop, you know, parts or aspects of the hip hop movement um, that late 70s going into the 80s. So um, again, things always repeat themselves. And I think a lot of people probably don't connect those, um, those two style um, trends or influences. Um, you know, so that's what Dandy has to say. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so true. I, I, I think you know, talking about rebellion, I have to quote you, Alfonso, as you said, uh, I, I'll just I'll just say I have to quote you, Alfonso, because I do. Um, when we talk about rebellion, I have to quote you, Alfonso, as you say, the rebellion was through conformity. And so that was sort of, when, it, when you talk about the overall look of how jazz bands presented themselves, it was very much in a sort of, we are a part of society. It's already been written, right? We're already here. We're, we are brilliant. We know this. We're, we're a part of this, uh, this American society. And we look the part. And yes, we're, we're gifted. <laughs> yes, our music is fantastic. And it, may, it, makes, you, it makes you bounce. But there's, there's also nothing to fear, right? And and so as much as I, I, I do, I also love these moments that you're talking about where you see, you know, the hat tilted and it's, and it's, it's just in there. But at the same time, that's the subtle thing. That's the subtle thing that says to the world in a way like, yeah, I know. Stuff is, you know, it's tough. And, and, and to think, and think about that, think about that little, that little, it's like a rebellion in a rebellion, <laughs> you know, because they had to go in the back door because, you know, Louie would be, you know, on stage in Chicago blowing people's minds, but then to walk down the street a second after and confront racism and for that to be the norm. The, to that to be the, the cycle, this weird shell game where you are lauded for your brilliance, but at the same time, you know, confronted with racism. You, you, you know, you gotta, you gotta have that, that little moment of rebellion, style rebellion. Yeah. And I, I really the love other... the subtlety of it. I know that it can be hard to read. And so that's why we need experts like you, um, both of you to like look at the pictures and, you know, um, read the memoirs and tell us about these tiny little things that sometimes would go unnoticed to people who aren't experts in kind of menswear or the period. Yeah, what were you going to say, Alfonso? It's subtle stuff. What, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was just going to talk a little bit lead up to the 20s. Um, so I, I looked at a several, um, about 100 years of sheet music from 1840s to the 1940s, 1950s um, at different um, archives. So um, published sheet music's published sheet music was one way for um, writers of songs to get their music out. So you would buy sheet music to um, play your piano or whatever instrument you have in your house. So obviously a lot of African-Americans didn't have, especially in the 1840s. Right. Um, these had great influence on America and mm -hmm. what their, um, how they thought of African-Americans. So some, some of this sheet music had positive representation, some extremely negative. Right. Over a hundred years of my analysis, I noticed that prior to the Civil War, their representations were much more softer. Um, af mostly African-American men were portrayed and they were kind of docile and not aggressive or anything. But as we get into after the Civil War and definitely into the teens and the 20s, there's really harsh representations. So the jazz um, musicians, as well as the females, 
they definitely, female singers, they definitely um, polish their dress to kind of defy these representations. So for the men, as Dandy said, it was subtle, but what it meant is um, you had sharp shoes, your shoes were polished, you had a nice tie, um, you had a boutonniere. We know James P. Johnson, Willie the Lion Smith, they would have a cigar. They were like the sporty man, but they're high posture and always carrying themselves well. Duke Ellington learned that in DC. His father's like, you always carry yourself well. I know me, grow, even growing up, this goes into the 70s and 80s. When I was growing up, my mom said, you don't leave the house, you know, your shoes tied, your shirt tucked in. She said, you always look polished and make a good representation when you leave the house. And so I think that's so interesting that 1920s, the teens, that this kind of carried on in the Black community and the Black family to always carry yourself well because you're representing us all. Yeah, I mean, that's that's it. Being Black in a public space, uh, you know, it's it's it can sometimes be a job. And part of that job is 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 almost that you are a representative of your culture, of your people, uh, because in many situations, uh, you know, maybe not in New York City, <laughs> but there are certainly some places in this country where people have never met or interacted with a black person. They've never had a conversation with a black person. And, and so, and, and there are certainly lots of places in the world where that's never happened either. You know, I know for instance, when I went to Australia, there were a lot of people that had never you know, like a place like Perth, you know, which is like the far reaches of Australia, they'd never met a black person like me at all. And so in that situation, I have to represent my people. You know, you have to step out. You have to make sure that you look put together. Um, you're wearing, you're wearing your, you, you're wearing your, your education, your class, your job, you're wearing all of those things on your sleeves. Your Sunday best. That's it. <laughs> Gotta have on your Sunday best. And you and see how these ideas were so important going in decades later in the civil rights movement. All of these things come down through Black American culture from the 19th century and earlier. And, you know, when the cameras were there, when we were on the world stage, all of those, you know, lessons from the Black family were on display. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the civil rights movement, they were all wearing suits. Mm -hmm. They were all wearing suits. And that, you know, that wasn't, uh, you know, that wasn't an accident. Um, it's, it, you know, a, as you say, sun, Sunday best, Alfonso. It's like when you're looking through the history of it, when you're looking at African-Americans role in American society, it is, incumbent upon us to put our best foot forward, to dispel the myth, to undermine the bigotry, to undermine all of these things that are almost accepted as fact for most people that we may interact with. Um, they, you know, there are various, whether before it was uh, the news media, maybe it, it was the minstrel show, you know, before it was, uh, um, maybe an, uh, 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 you know, before you were hearing it, maybe from the New York Times when they were talking about, I think there was an article that I, I'll, I'll, I'll send to you guys, but there was an article that was talking about the British saying that, I think it was in 1929, that the British were saying that we needed, that Americans needed to stop this jazz thing. That this this was a, a stain as it were it would un, it would corrupt you know society these 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 things are are constantly happening and so through style through dress um through the way that we act in public uh we have to counteract that and they did they did it so well yeah i wanted to touch on that real quick um there was, I think another reason the um, jazz performers dressed up is because they had, oppos they had opposition from mainstream white society, some. Yes. yes. Um, but they also had it from the black church. And oftentimes many of the musicians such as Teddy Wilson, mm -hmm. 
they weren't his parents and his um, the people that he went to church with weren't you know applauding him for wanting to be a jazz pianist. They were like. Um, he recalls when he was young saying that, you know, when he'd walk around, they say, yonder goes the devil, <laughs> the women in the church. So that's how jazz, for some communities, um, jazz was not, you know, it was kind of um, not the best music. They wanted, you know, more traditional um, gospel music. Also, um, as Danny talked about in the early days of jazz, it was sometimes spelled J-A-S-S -S or yep. J-A-S. And what jazz one of the reasons they say is that jazz was kind of like jazz in the music um, mm. and, and it sound not so, you know, right. doing a little twist on it, jazz in it. So it was it was considered a negative. And in this picture, we're looking at Nina Mae McKinney. She starred in Hallelujah in 1929. And I love this movie because um, whenever she's doing bad, something bad in the movie, they're playing jazz music. And oftentimes it's St. Mm -hmm. Louis blues. And I've watched a lot of movies out of Hollywood and the most reference song is St. Louis Blues. There's some, it can be played so many different ways, but it's always got this like kind of churning sound to it. Um, I got the St. Louis Blues just as blue as I can be. And it's always, they always use it when the um, actor, the main character is doing something bad. <laughs> gambling right. or dancing in the club or something. Um, so in this movie, she played kind of a wayward woman. Um, she finds religion and then she loses religion. And again, when she loses it again, they're playing St. Louis blues. So um, jazz was, you know, it, it received negative treatment in a lot of Hollywood movies. Um, mm. But um, kind of in a light way, I mean, it was almost to entice people. Um, and then they, uh, they also portrayed jazz in a um, positive light and helped for it to become um, mainstream music. Well, speaking of the mainstream, um, what elements of jazz dress do you feel made their way into the mainstream? Um, and do we see any of that carry on into the 20s or throughout the 20s into the 60s or even into the present day? Um, I think it's difficult with jazz because jazz dress, um, how the jazz artist dressed was the style of the day. Yeah. What was different, what I think what was unique about it is that we were able to, for people at that time, they were able to go to clubs and see all these men dressed in the same way. And so I think um, what they, what was pushed forward was not so much a particular artifact that they were wearing or garment that they were wearing. I think what was pushed forward is how you carry yourself. Uh, maybe how you tilt your head. If you think about a um, Fat Swaller or Willie the Lion Smith and kind of their, their demeanor, demeanor and um, just the way they carry themselves, Duke Ellington. It's just this, I think that's what's pushed forward into the, the 30s, the 40s and maybe even present day. Obama, you think of President Obama, you know, he's like, he has aspects of Duke Ellington, he has aspects of Dizzy Gillespie, this coolness to him. Cool. cool That's the word, cool. Yeah. yeah. The coolness and jazz artists heightened that. Um, they were cool. People wanted to be like them. Um, the singers, Bessie Smith, Alberta Hunter, um, at the waters, they, they were sexy. These black women were sexy and how they moved. Um, and they looked like their communities, um, they, they were the size of their community. So these were women that they, they could, um, the black community could look up to and they were of their same race. And so here, um, Esther, we see like this large, these large hats with the feathers in them. And um, it's just like this um, exaggeration. And Bessie Smith would wear a lot of, um, sometimes they called them lampshade hats. <laughs> Because they would be, they'd wear these outrageous hats with like um, beading and feathers and things. Um, and in the picture you just showed, she has on pants, which I think is a fabulous in the 1930s here in Philadelphia. And she just looks in control with like these um, seven men behind her. Like it's so modern for the 1930s. Um, you know, these tux, almost like this tuxedo of um, Marlena Dietrich. Um, and I think this 1930s, this was prior to um, Morocco, uh, where Marlena Dietrich did wear the um, tuxedo and kiss the woman in the movie. So um, 
yeah, this top hat with Bessie Smith. I mean, you can't get any more modern than that. It would be relevant today. Yeah, I love that because, you know, you also see that with Gladie Bentley, you know, Gladie Bentley being that, that, uh, you know, uh, sort of just a, just an archetype of brilliance, <laughs> you know, a total, a total show woman. I mean, I look at, I look at Gladie Bentley's outfits and being a queer woman during that time in the Harlem Renaissance, um, you know, when you look at the, the, the famous illustration, one of my absolute favorite illustrations, it's, it's in fact, it's right there, <laughs> a nightclub map of Harlem, you know, mm -hmm. Gladys Clam House is right on there. Yeah. Um, and so you you very much have um, you very much have black people conforming to society and sending a message, but also challenging, but you know, also innovating, also testing the waters, testing things out and seeing what what works for them. Um, and you know, and even even just specifically within queer history, this is where we I think we get a lot of during the Harlem Renaissance get a lot of really incredible queer icons, a lot of people stepping out and you know and expressing themselves for the first time. There 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 hadn't been that kind of agency for African Americans up until that moment. Yeah. Um, it's a really it's a really powerful time. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, please. I was just going to add, along with Gladys Bentley, um, as Dandy said, um, there was also a lot of rebellion in, you know, distant in other cities, Philadelphia, Atlanta, and like stories we don't hear about. I came across one story. Well, here in Philadelphia, I went investigated many of the um, through the Philadelphia Tribune, um, many of the establishments of where they went to um, amazing names like the Wonder Bar, the Checker Cafe. Mm -hmm. um, there was one I read, a few of them had female impersonators and one of them was known as Gloria Swanson. So I'm looking back and I'm like, wow, <laughs> in 1920 in Philadelphia, there's a female impersonator known as Gloria Swanson. Yes. They, oftentimes, the black community it's this sense that there was no acceptance of um, a lifestyle other than straight and there there is definitely a record and i've read later in ebony magazine there were other female personators that i that were in ebony magazine um mm -hmm. or talked about when um they they passed um so I think that's there's rebellion there too, and that's somewhat through jazz music. These um, a lot of these clubs had floor shows, um, so they'd have a jazz orchestra or band, and they'd also do floor shows, much like the Cotton Club, or, right. um, the Cotton Club, the Savoy Ballroom, um, the Renaissance Ballroom in Harlem. So that same, maybe on a lesser level, smaller venues, but it happened in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Chicago, Atlanta. Um, it's amazing. Oh yeah. I also will say when we just think when we think about um, the styles of the past coming forward to today, I mean that's my entire world. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm part of a community, a worldwide community, literally from you know from LA to Australia to Japan to New York to Sweden to Brazil of people that love old things and dress this way. And so, you know, even within, even that being a part of a subculture, there are still aesthetics from it that radiate from that, mm -hmm. you know, and from, from images of the past to old music, it's still a, a big part of our, our everyday culture, you know? Maybe uh, people who don't dig into history may see a little bit of the 1950s in Katy Perry, you know? Or they may see, you know, a, a, a little bit of the 1920s, or even just um, sort of Egyptian Orientalism in in some people's in in some other people's uh, work, but it's it still permeates our society. It's still there. Um, we're still taking notes. <laughs> we're still taking notes from the past. 
Yeah. Absolutely. It's so interesting that it's this two-way street that we have these things from the 20s coming forward to the present, but we also have things um, like queer communities and things that we think are so modern that go back much farther than we think. So mm. it's such a fascinating um, kind of exchange and jazz is really kind of this lubricant in this period that you know helps it flow both ways. So and it's, un oh yes, please. And, and, and prohibition. <laughs> <laughs> It, it helps that people were searching were searching for a drink every day. <laughs> it was definitely like this um, this kind of crucible, all of these things coming together at that time. It's undeniable that fashion and style was so deeply connected to jazz. Um, but do you think that there are other periods where it was just as important? Um, our show that the grad students put on looks at the 20s and the 60s, or perhaps the 60s, or maybe some other period um, outside of the 20s that you find that really strong connection. I, I think from, you know, in my book, I kind of identified to me that one of the key um, elements of jazz is that it's all about, which Duke Ellington talked about, it's all about freedom of expression mm -hmm. and it's storytelling. So it was storytelling of the black community. It was their um, freedom to express themselves like they hadn't been able to. <laughs> um, so I always, those two things, freedom of expression and storytelling. So you move forward and I think we think, uh, Danny's gonna name some few, but I think we look at um, the 60s modern jazz was again, another period of freedom of expression, storytelling. They dressed more casual, like in this image, Duke, Gell Duke excuse me, Dizzy Gillespie, um, yeah. wearing almost like a um, casual knit with a um, yeah. collar. Very, you know, they, they lost those, those tuxedos and suits. Then we think about the 70s and disco, storytelling and expression. Um, I think of the period that I love, which is like the um, 90s, of house music, which, um, and as always, it's about freedom of expression and storytelling. And then obviously the hip hop and rap movement, late seventies, definitely elements of that. So I think it's it's always connected to youth, a lot of times youth um, and explorations of musical styles, uh, musical innovation, and then they're expressing themselves and they're telling their story. Um, you think of salt and pepper, um, the Sugar Hill Gang, um, mm. yeah, I mean, amazing. Dandy? Yeah, I mean, that's it. it. It it really is, I mean, just even thinking about it from the 1920s as a start, to see that all those years of slavery, people hadn't been telling their story. They hadn't been expressing themselves. They hadn't been, you know, not to the, not not even to the, not to the point where they had such a big audience or, you know, I mean, you know, pe whatever people talk, you know, it's in the blues when they're in the church, they say something, but, you know, the, 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 the output of expression was not the same because it could not be the same. And then here you are in the twenties and the, it, it's clearly a, a modern age. Innovation is happening, you know? And then you have this new music that makes your, your, oldest, your oldest feelings anew through the music, you know? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, everything that you've been complaining about, <laughs> all your troubles, uh, you know they they can they can touch they can touch somebody somebody can connect to that and it's really powerful and you just and and you just see it moving forward and forward and yes jazz uh really got commercialized in the 1940s but there were still people who needed it needed to tell a story needed to say something uh needed to express themselves where they felt like um, their voice was, you know, their voice was being smothered. Um, and yeah, and, and all, all throughout, I mean, that is, that is, that is what, you know, gangster rap as it, as it was, as it was coined, that's what it was. It was, it was trying to express the reality of something to the, to the world, or at least just, just finding a way to give voice to it so that you don't go crazy, mm -hmm. you know? 
So I want to finish up with one last question because it is so important that the work that both of you do, Alfonso through your scholarship, Dandy through your music and your very presence, um, to think about how deeply connected the jazz age is to black communities and black artists. But in our current age, we see a lot of kind of depictions of jazz, um, the jazz age, the twenties, um, the Harlem Renaissance, even that seems to kind of exclude black people. Mm. I'd love if you could, um, both of you could touch on that. Um, and though, of course, we do have um, lots of great things that have come out recently that do celebrate jazz artists, um, you know, movies and things like that. But I wonder if you could comment on that, um, how you feel about kind of depictions of the jazz age in contemporary society. Um, I guess I'll start. Um, I think it's improving. Um, as you mentioned, I think we're this year, I'm like, this year and last year, I'm like amazed with the content that is coming out. Um, I think it's due also because um, Hollywood has loosened up. So there's other, you know, there's Netflix, um, there's Amazon, there's so many things, um, there's ways to get things produced, Tyler Perry, but mm. the Billie Holiday movie coming out. Um, the bet we had Bessie Smith, we just had Ma Rainey by Viola Davis. I mean, it's amazing these stories that are being told. Um, I think Miles Davis is coming up. Um, so I think, yeah, there was a lack of representation um, in some earlier content out of Hollywood. Um, but the good thing is, I think there were what inspires my research is there were there was a ton of biographies done of these greats. Um, or co-written. So um, that's why we have Duke Ellington, we have you know, the biography of Duke Ellington, we have Count Basie, we have Billie Holiday, Dinah Washington, um, Mary Lou Williams. Um, we have jazz archives that celebrate their stories. So although it may have not been reflected in Hollywood and on film, um, it was literature, there were books. Um, so there were other ways to hear their stories. And now I think a lot of Tyler Perry, other ones, they're picking up these stories and now creating films for them. Dan, do you even say? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important. I think it's important for us to acknowledge that, um, that we have not always, if we haven't always been the, the best custodians of our history, we haven't been, we haven't always been the best amplifiers of that work because something that that you know is always important for people to remember is that this wasn't that long ago i mean none of it was the civil rights movement wasn't that long ago the 20s certainly wasn't that long ago and slavery definitely wasn't that long ago and so here we have a people that are um creating but you know trying to get as far away from the past in a lot of ways, as much as they see that there is, uh, there is, there are things to celebrate in the past. Those two things are in, in, in conflict. That's why when I walk down the street, you know, uh, people both appreciated, but are also confused <laughs> in Harlem because, you know, they, they, they can tell that, you know, I'm well-dressed and Black people have always appreciated being well-dressed, but then it also is of the past and what is that about and what is that, why, why, would, you, why would you deify this particular time period, you know, because, you know, obviously I haven't spoken to them, I'm just walking by on the street. Uh, and so we're, we're constantly having to grapple with that. Um, and so what ends up happening is a small group of people, as has always been the case, a small group of people make the decisions, make the art, or sorry, amplify the art, <laughs> pay for it, <laughs> and decide what's popular. And so, I mean, I'm thinking about even when I started really, uh, really not, not necessarily digging into this more, the like early music, but starting to see some uh, a mainstream mirroring. You know that was that was 2010, a little bit earlier, and that's when Boardwalk Empire came out. 
and think about it. Boardwalk Empire for how many seasons? Uh, and they finally got to Harlem in like the last couple of seasons. You know, Black expression in that series was very minimal. But it was such a big part of, you know, it, it was a big part of the, the 1920s. Um, and so many of the other films, I mean, even just the big one that made it, The, the Great Gatsby. Yes, absolutely. It's a story about a book that's very important. <laughs> the source material must be, you know, acknowledged and held up. But I, I, it's again and again, the stories are told without us in many situations when we are so um, intrinsic to the storytelling because our music is there, the style is there. You may have people, you know, in The Great Gatsby dressing like Cab Calloway and are, you know, acting like him. It's the influence is always there. So I'm, I'm really interested. Ma Rainey was incredible. Ma Rainey was incredible. Um, you know, show, uh, um, films like Soul, very, very important. There's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stories to tell. I mean, Alfonso, you and I could sit down on a Sunday and, and put on, put on, put on somebody's album and we could literally just write down names, names of stories that should be told because there are so many. They're still relevant. A hundred years later, you know, we're a hundred years out from the Harlem Renaissance, um, women's right to vote. Yes. And I think we're, we've been in a challenging year. And I think as we move forward with movies, the movies that I mentioned coming out, mm. I'm blessed to think that people, they want to understand the past. Yes. Um, it's great parts and it's bad parts. And then how can we move forward? So you cannot forget the past. I think oftentimes in maybe, um, sometimes we wanna just forget the past and say, oh, we're, we're, you know, we're completely modern now and everybody's thinking the same way. And it's, you know, it's yeah. not that way. And so we have to, these people strived and they um, fought and they struggled and they could, they, as you mentioned, they haven't been gone long enough. Billie Holiday died in 1959. Right. Um, so this, what they fought for. So it's great that we continue to remember them, um, mm. help us move forward in the future. Um, Cause they fought for these things over a hundred years ago, if not in, even um, further out 200, 300. So I think it's great. I think it's great that we're honoring them. Yeah. Yeah. The conversation needs to continue. And, you know, I, I think, I think it, it, in certain circles, it's getting down to the minutia of how people people under people are starting to really dig into the lineage of the things that they engage with. You know, I mean, even just like if you think about somebody who wants to live a healthy life, they want to know where all their food comes from. So when people start to listen to music or they start to engage with certain kinds of certain kinds of dress. Or even just, you know, see an ice cream truck go by, you think to yourself, oh, who was the inventor of, <laughs> of that refrigerated truck? You know, <laughs> it was a black person. It was. And so, so there is an opportunity every day to learn more about the past and 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 push these stories forward. Um, uh, not just, you know, not just for 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 black people, but for the, the society at large. And I, I think it's, we're definitely, uh, I'm, I'm interested to see what the next wave is because the, the thought process is that everything that we saw last year was already in the can. You know what I'm saying? That was already in the can. Mm -hmm. So so what are the stories that will be told next with this, with this new knowledge, this new um, purpose, you know, that, that we were, that we were given in in the summer of 2020. Well, gentlemen, I would like to thank both of you for 
sharing your insight and your knowledge with us tonight. It's a fascinating conversation. I'm sure everyone is going to enjoy it. And um, it's a really great accompaniment to the grad stu uh, graduate student exhibition, Roaring and Swinging. So thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you.